Welcome to Return on Character Podcast, the podcast that tells character shaping stories with famous and should be famous leaders. I'm Dan Cooper, founder of Rock Investments, and co hosting with me today is Jess Larson, founder of Greystoke Investments. Oh, I'm so excited to introduce this person, John Montgomery. Um, a legend in my mind, at least, and I hope he'll be a legend in many others. Uh, you know, one of the tag, the tagline for rock, uh, investment podcasts is going to be character shaping stories with famous and should be famous leaders. Well, if ever there was a man that deserves to be famous, it's this man. And, uh, if ever there was a man that doesn't want to be famous, it's, it's this man as well. It's John Montgomery. Founder of Bridgeway Capital Management, uh, John is uh, has has been working in in the investment world, specifically in the mutual fund business, for thirty years. I think they're a year shy of their their thirty uh, year anniversary. Uh, they're one of the most diversified uh, and progressive investment pro uh, groups in the in the industry. They currently have about five point two billion dollars under management. Um, but the coolest thing about, uh, Bridgeway Capital Management is not just so much that they deliver and serve their clients in extraordinary ways, but they also, uh, have, I've witnessed a culture at this com company like I've never seen. Uh, how one, uh, generates a culture like this, uh, is something that we just can get into with, with, uh, with John. And one of the founding principles of John's business in the early days was to give 50% of his profits away from day one. And he's been doing that for 30 years. So John uh, Montgomery, uh, it's a true honor to have you here and thank you so much for coming on. And uh, I just wanted to, I guess, you know, one of the things that um, as a way to start off, uh, as you know, we are oriented around our discussions around character why it matters. And, uh, and I was hoping that to lead off, you might share with us a moment in your life that you felt like was one of your biggest character defining moments. Uh, that could be personal or that could be within your business. Uh, but I, we'd love to hear some of the stories that have shaped your life and, and, and what's made you who you are today. Well, Dan, let me stick with, uh, let me stick with the investment industry and my own experience. Um, at Bridgeway, um, you know, uh, shaping one's own character, uh, we have a, a common friend, uh, Joe Ritchie, whom I met in 2005. Um, and one of the things he taught me was uh, we spend so much of our life trying to get comfortable. Um, but if you step how you actually grow as a person, it's always when the cart's in the ditch. It's when things are um, much harder uh, than easier, and uh, and that's when you really grow and learn. Uh, so the first time I heard that from uh, Joe Ritchie, I thought I had to like replay my my uh, the videotape of my life to see if I thought that was true. And um, I think that is. I grew up in a uh, you know a safe uh, environment with two parents and a roof over my head and food on the table. Uh, so I didn't, uh, I didn't go through some of the things of the people that we uh, felt on the foundation side of Bridgeway, but nevertheless, everybody, um, experiences, uh, things in their life, uh, that are harder and more difficult and actually starting Bridgeway, uh, by an objective standard would be, uh, one of those. Um, I had a business plan that had us break, breaking even in 12 months and it took 36 months, three years, um, to get there. Um, that's not unusual for new businesses. Um, and, uh, I have a, I have an MBA from Harvard business school, but, but I didn't take a single course in entrepreneurship. That probably was a good thing because I had no idea of what percentage of new companies don't make it. Um, and that was, uh, that was probably good that I didn't know because I was just charging ahead. Um, but clearly in the first year we were off, um, the path of, uh, my business plan. Uh, and that is a time where you really think about what's important, why you're doing what you're doing, uh, and is this what you're called to do? Um, so, uh, you know, pressure was on. Um, I was thinking, oh, gosh, now I've hired a few people and their livelihoods depend on this as well. Uh, we were doing a very good job for our shareholders in delivering 
um, the service and, and uh, returns uh, in accordance with design that we had, um, that we had uh, talked with them about. But, um, but the harder times are uh, thinking about um, where, what choices you make and don't make. And those come up real time, though you can't anticipate all of those. That is where character comes into play. So one of the first things that came up was something that we refer to as soft dollars. Um, and it would have been very uh, convenient and uh, it would have brought in uh, some additional revenues to Bridgeway had we taken part in soft dollars. Soft dollars is where um, you uh, basically use client transactions at brokerage firms uh, you use some of that money to pay for things like um, data and subscriptions and even, even software back then. It, the rules have tightened up on that. Um, but but I, I did not want to cross that line. I thought people pay us an advisory fee. We should be paying for our own data and materials. We're just going to say no. Uh, and we were a leader in that. M many more firms followed us in the three decades since. Um, but it was just clear in my mind by way of doing the right thing for our clients uh, that we wouldn't do that, even though it could have been really helpful uh, in the beginning. So hard times. But did anyone know that you were doing that, John? Did anyone, did you get any points for that early on or was it just an internal discussion? Yes and no. Um uh, in, initially, it was just a decision that we made, but you, you get a track record of making uh, decisions like that, um, and we had shareholder letters. Uh, we would differentiate that, and so yes, people people did hear about it. People still, you know, didn't know what soft dollars were. Um, it, by and large, uh, retail investors, um, some some more sophisticated investors, uh, did. But I like to think that uh, you leave behind. Uh, a lot of telltale signs of what your character looks like. So one of the things I thought in setting up Bridgeway three decades ago was if a, if a person, if a, just a random person comes in, doesn't know your company is trying to get to know it, you want them looking under every rock and having this, the same story told of who you are, what you stand for, and what's important. And that's what character um, strongly relates to. I like that. Did did you ever have a moment, you know, uh, John, I guess I, I'm going to pivot a little bit is like, I always wonder what pers a person's inspiration for wanting to try to do the right thing is. Like, where does it come from? Where did you, where did it come from to say, hey, I'm going to give 50% of my profits away? I mean, most people would put you in a mental institute for doing that. You did it voluntarily. Where does that come from, John? Like, how does that grow into somebody? Can you answer that question? It could be you can't. Well, yeah, let me, let me, let me, let me answer it more generally and then specifically. Uh, in the big picture, um, I love service industries, every kind of service industry, hotel, uh, you know, uh, the, the Uber taxi you take, um, an airline. I love studying the experience of service. Um, and I, and I, I do this, um, along the way, um, I've learned to distinguish it better and, and express appreciation, uh, along the way. I want to get to the heart of why, what motivates you to kind of try to be the best you can be. I mean, I, I, it, it's like, it's an unusual thing for a founder of a very successful company to give away 50% of his profits. Uh, from the beginning and to create, create and build a culture, uh, like you have. But the difference with you is that you started when you had nothing. You started, uh, this posture whenever the company was pretty much just scratching to get going. And you said, this is going to be a foundational pillar in the way we do things. And to me, the curious question is like, how does a human being develop out of this world to want to do that? Like, why was there, was there some book you read? Was there some individual that, you know, did, did an angel show up and talk to you on your shoulder? What was it that caused you to, to, to behave this way and, and to build a company like this? It's, it's pretty unique. Well, Dan, I like to say that people don't do things for just one reason. Um, human, human behavior is complicated. 
Um, and every once in a while, you know, I hear myself giving like a business school answer to a question like that and then step back and it's like, do I know that that's really why I'm doing that? Or is it, you know, the home I was raised in and the country that I happen to be, you know, plucked down on um, at birth or uh, or the friends that I meet like you along the way? And I guess the honest answer is it's probably all of those and some things that I haven't even uh, distinguished yet. But I will say two things. One is um, I love service industries um, and I'm always looking for ways to improve things. Or if I personally experience poor service, I think that's the great thing about the capitalist system is it invites competition for somebody to come in and do a better job. So I knew we wanted to start a company that was going to become a great place to work. You know, you spend a lot of hours at work and if you get the opportunity to um, affect the culture of the place we work. By the way, you do not have to be owner founder to do that. Anybody from any place in the organization can do that. And that's what culture is. Um, so I just had a desire to like, let's make it a great place to work. Let's, let's make sure that the, um, the people we serve are experiencing great service and listen to them and get better over time. I'm an engineer by training. So small continuous improvements is, um, one of our. Uh, mantras on the generosity side. Um, I grew up, <laughs> I grew up in the wealthiest wealthiest neighborhood in Houston, Texas, um, and so we didn't lack for material things. But one of the things that I noticed uh, among you know the neighbors and people I grew up with was having having a lot of stuff and wealth is not always a good thing. And you can think of it as like, it causes, you know, complications. It can be a good thing. Money is a tool and money is what we manage, right? So it's, it's our business um, uh, to do it well. But you also want to use it as a tool for good in the world. Um, and the generous giving company uh, personally and, and, and at the corporate level uh, is an opportunity to do amazing things in the world. Um, so I thought I had a dozen good ideas 30 years ago in starting a business. and. I'd say maybe three of them are marketable. <laughs> it's not every good idea is really a good idea, or maybe it's a good idea, but you don't have a way to actually implement it. But the one that was 10 times more powerful than I had any clue of was giving back half. Uh, it, 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 it gives you a, um, a, a key into purpose that helps attract amazing people that you get to work with. Um, people, it, it's much harder for people to quote, buy them uh, away from you because they like who they work with and they know we're changing the world. Um, so that's my, that's my answer on generosity is like, why wouldn't you do this? If, if other business people could get inside my head and see the power of this and how much fun it is, there would be a lot more companies, um, uh, engaging, uh, and you know, generosity is not just money, uh, it's time and energy and, uh, commitment to. Uh, moving the needle in the world. I hope we do all of those things and continue to get better at it. John, I, I've really been looking forward to meeting you. Dan's been saying great things about you uh, ever since I met him. Um, and uh, I just started reading, I got about a, I'm on chapter 14 of the book, um, How to Stop a Warlord and, and hearing about the work that you guys did and countering the LRA and, and Joseph Coney and the, the child soldiers and the tr child trafficking and things that are very, you know, we've got a, a uh, charity called uh, the Child Rescue Association that combats child trafficking I've done for the last 13 years. And I'm just so impressed with with how effective you guys were. And like, I can't wait to get through the second two thirds of the book. Um, I, I think one of the first questions for me um, is, you know, uh, this idea of, of character for the show is really a lot around, you know, integrity, responsibility, uh, forgiveness, empathy. When you think about traits like that, Who's a hero of yours? Like, who do you look up to? You know, uh, they're all around us. Uh, so I do have heroes in, in different um, places from the, from the work that we've done through the foundation and that you're reading about in that book, To Stop a Warlord. Um, uh, I had the opportunity to be on an email list um, with um, Archbishop Tutu. Um, and this man is amazing at expressing appreciation. You, you know, you think of, he's just the most humble guy and it doesn't matter who he's talking to. He's always on the lookout and he just shows up with positive energy and love. And the first time, you know, I noticed, I was like, 
wow, how can I become a student of Archbishop Tutu? Um, so, uh, so I just like started collecting them and, and studying how he does what he does. So that would be an example of a hero, but, uh, but just heroes are all around us. If you, if you, if you stop and listen, everybody's got a story. Everybody has, you know, suffered something in their life. Um, people are going through great stuff and hard stuff. Um, and they're just you know, if you, re if you really knew the story on any random person you sit down with in a restaurant or on a plane, um, and they were really tell were, they, they were felt comfortable enough to tell you what was really going on. They're just heroes right and left. Um, so I love that list of four that you mentioned, uh, with integrity, which is also Bridgeway's number one, uh, business value. And we say it, it trumps everything else. That one comes first. Um, but, the the four cornerstones of return on character, um, being integrity, responsibility, forgiveness, and empathy. I just love that combination. Um, and you can think about people, you know, that show up, um, in each one of those. Uh, and, and I, sadly, I think I spent the first two thirds of my life blowing past a lot of that till I really started trying to study it and learn and recognize that everybody has something to offer. And if you, if you reflect that back, and I had a, I had a coach who's uh, now passed away, Ann McGee Cooper, who was just amazing um, at reflecting back what, she, what you said and heard. She would take a conversation and synthesize it and send you back an email. It's like, this isn't stuff she made up. It's like what you said. But she, she was just amazing at taking the best of you and showing you a mirror of that. I mean, wow. That's another, like, I'm, I love being a student of powerful people like that. Um, how do you, how do you learn how, uh, to do a better job of that? So I'm 66, um, never stop learning. Um, and I'm, my, my mom is 99. Um, and she's, a mo she's a big model to me of that. She's, she's more up on current events than almost anybody I know. Um, and, uh, uh, never stops learning, takes courses at the women's Institute here in our hometown of Houston. Um, so I'm, a, I'm a believer in, uh, continual learning and character, um, character. We've got a lot more to learn about. And that's one of the things that excites me, uh, about, uh, rock and, uh, return on character, uh, is that we're intentionally looking at how to understand it, how to improve it, how to um, train other people and train ourselves. Dan and I are going through this ourselves right now. Dan, I don't know if you um, want to talk about that, but um, but he and I are both active, real-time students of some of the advanced work that's been done in this area. Well, um, I mean, there's a few things that I think it's important that the audience understands here. Um, and that is, is that, of course, um, you know, this is the Return on Character podcast, uh, generously lifted up and hosted together with Jess and the uh, innovation and leadership crew. Uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, our focus is trying to find leaders uh, in the public markets that have the highest degree of character that we can identify and give the market an opportunity to invest in them. And, um, and so that's our business. That's our focus. Uh, but part of doing that is finding people that also believe in wanting to support the effort to bring something like this to market. And Bridgeway Capital Management is one of those groups uh, that wanted to be a part of this with me uh, in launching this. Uh, and so my my kind of my natural question to John is, is like, why? You know, I, what I love about what I love about uh, what we're doing with with, with Bridge A Capital Management is and and other invest investors. But what what what's really kind of unique here with John is that he brings the the background in the financial industry uh, into a sector or an, or an approach uh, that's very oriented towards personal behavior that I know is deep rooted in a, in his heart. And they're kind of coming and they're combining, you know, in a unique way. Uh, and so I, one of the things, John, I would love to hear you speak to is what attracted you to the return on character concept of investing? Dan, I think it's purpose. I'm a purpose-driven individual. Uh, and 
Um, uh, I, we met in 2005, but, uh, you know, didn't, didn't know each other well, reconnected a little over a year ago. Um, and, uh, just in the audience, if, if you, if you meet Dan in person like that, it, it, it's electric. Uh, if you're a purpose driven individual, um, you're going to want to be on his team. Uh, so there's certainly, um, that electricity. Why is it important, um, by way of moving the needle in the world is where I go. Uh, more specifically in that, uh, and that works like this for me. If, if, if rock investments can demonstrate in the marketplace that character actually does matter, then CEOs of publicly held firms, um, will be in boardrooms where their boards are asking them, why are you not on this? Uh, this uh, list of high character CEOs because clearly it matters and clearly people are starting to care about it. Um, if that's true, then it will, it will move the needle in terms of hiring, uh, pr professional development of leaders. Um, and, uh, and you know, when they need to cut loose of somebody. So all those things are the purview of boards of directors. Um, CEOs, you know, are, a key to the leadership team. And if they're asking that question uh, and CEOs start to pay more attention, think what happens next. Like, oh, I need to get training in this area. I need to do a better job on this. How do you distinguish this? And why are there these four specific pillars? And do I agree with them? Well, it's, it, it's, it's, it's hard not to agree with them if you've, um, you know, if you're engaging in life and relationship. Uh, but it's not just publicly held firms. Think of further on down again with success and and training and uh and the attention that's called it it privately held firms you don't have to be a publicly held firm for this to you know make sense and why would you even stop at business this is true in academia this is true in for-profit business this is true in non-profit uh um uh, uh, businesses and charities there's no organization where character doesn't make a difference and and it's also at the level of your family it's like, there's no place where this doesn't make a difference. And if we come to understand what it is, how you measure it and how you can improve upon it, which is the research that underlies this, think of the change that you could make in the world. Think of the change that that could represent. So that's what I love about, um, that's what attracted me to, um, this venture and why I'm in it and I'm thrilled and can't wait to, you know, see the next year and next decade and, uh, how we can move the needle. Well, John, you've been an inspiration to me and one of the greatest supporters of this effort, uh, to kind of bring to the world an opportunity to allocate capital on the basis of a certain set of behaviors. And we've chosen, uh, integrity, responsibility, forgiveness, and compassion as the leading markers for character. And those are the things that we go out there uh, and the public markets looking for, uh, every day, uh, and, and deliver it in, in our, uh, ETF, uh, to, to, to the world. Jess, uh, you know, there's, there's so many directions we could go here, uh, on this, but, um, I, I, I really would love to get your thoughts, uh, uh, and, and, and input here on, on, on what, what John's been saying. Thanks, Dan. You know, John, I think one of the next questions I have for you has to do with my own learning. I, I consider myself a lifelong learner. I'm pretty addicted to audiobooks. I love watching the, you know, Warren Buffett, Berkshire Hathaway annual shareholder meetings on YouTube and these kind of things. But for me, so often, I want to know the source first. Like, before I want the information, I want to know who it's coming from as kind of a filter for how much I'm ready to buy in. And so... Uh, I think I would love to talk a little bit more about Bridgeway and and uh, the kind of things that you've achieved that these opinions are coming from. Um, uh, just for a reminder, what do you guys have for total assets under management at this point? Uh, in round numbers, five billion. Five billion. So you think about how many thousands of asset managers there are out there, and most of them dream of getting over the one billion dollar mark, let alone over five billion. Um, when you think about such a significant accomplishment like that, that statistically is, is quite unlikely. What do you feel like are some of the main things that you've done that others haven't done that have helped you reach this accelerated level of success? Jess, I think, 
you know, there, there are several different ways to come at that, but um, a key one I think is uh, people uh, at every level and investing in people. Uh, the intention of, you know, starting a firm and then relentlessly going after being a great place to work and listening to people about what that means. Um, and, and, and you don't do that, um, you know, for everyone I'm in founding bridge where I thought, well, this is going to be a great place for anybody, um, to work, but, but, but part of our culture is also, um, learning communication skills and practicing them at a high level. Uh, we have a practice of rotating leadership of some, uh, meetings. Uh, the, the opening of our monthly partner meeting, which and partners are all the, uh, all the people with a long-term commitment to Bridgeway. So that's not just like the t mo most highly paid people. That's roughly 35 people. Um, and we rotate that and, and, and there are some people for whom that assignment is hugely scary. And so we work with them on that, but we're also committed to um, to sharing and, and, and growing. And it's not just a, it's not really just a place where you put in your hours and you go home. Caring is a common thread, um, to all of that. So j being intentional about like, we're going to build something great. Like that's what we're about. And if you think it's like, oh, that's fine. But you know, like I, I draw a paycheck and if that's your attitude, you know, please don't come to Bridgeway. <laughs> Like there are other places to work and get a paycheck, right? Um, we're about uh, changing uh, the world. Uh, and I have a, uh, you know, I have a, a personal calling to ending genocide and, and peacemaking uh, is part of my love. And how. I, but we have people that um, do all kinds of uh, other things and ways to engage. We've done a handful of potable water projects. Um, and... Uh, part of that is generosity, um, but it's always relationship. It's relationship with the people we work with, with our clients, um, and then communities. And so we like to go out. Um, we, 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 at our last partner meeting last week, we, they, um, and we didn't have our normal, um, Zoom or in-person uh, way to uh, gather. We went to the Houston Food Bank and spent a few hours and two shifts working uh, at the local food bank. And you, you, you know, you might think it was like, well, that's kind of crazy. And how does that contribute to um, to our clients' needs and investments? Uh, the fact of the matter is, relationships are important. Being about something uh, uh, big is makes a difference in how you show up, and it makes it it bleeds over into all your other relationships. So those are client relationships, and it's your relationships even at home. We have testimonies of people, you know, that talk about how the servant leadership skills that we, um, that we do at Bridgeway on a continual basis, um, affects a relationship with a teenager or their spouse, um, or a parent or somebody that they, you know, some friend that they've gotten, you know, crosswise with and were able to, you know, do something with. So these, these things interrelate. Um, and it makes it fun, uh, to figure out, you know, how to continue to, uh, get better at it and invest in people and have that be a good thing for our clients and which are obviously the, the first reason that we're here is serving them. Uh, that's great to hear. And I'll put a shameless plug for one of our previous guests, uh, Ken Blanchard, uh, his book, Servant Leadership in Action. If you don't have that one yet, it's excellent. I read it about four months ago. I, I think it's been out for quite some time, and I just hadn't seen it. But I did, I did, uh, I did read it just to, not not too long ago. All those collections of essays are, are fun, aren't they? Um, they are. Well, I want to talk about the other half of that. Of you know, that connection and that relationship is so important, and we need to be doing something that actually works when we're with those relationships. And you know, being a, a devotee of Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett and, and some of that crowd, I loved hearing about some of your investment philosophies on other interviews about, you know, going after the, the smaller cap companies where there's maybe a little more of an information edge that's available because they're not covered wall to wall like an Apple or something. And I loved hearing about your, your low debt strategies to really be able to be defensive if there's a big market change. Um, I'm guessing that not everybody you hire comes with the level of investment sophistication that you have. 
I'm interested in what that looks like inside your firm to help, to help everyone across Bridgeway kind of bring some more of these, you know, the skills that, that create a higher return, what, what that training or continuous improvement looks like internally. Justin, another part of our hiring philosophy and for me personally over decades has been always hire people that are better than yourself. You always aim for above, you know, wherever you are uh, currently. So there are on our investment team of about 12 uh, people plus our, our trading uh, folks who are the ones that actually execute um, trades, there are three PhDs. Um, and you could, you could add at least two or three more people that can run circles around me in numbers and statistics, which is by the way, how we do what we do at Bridgeway. We have an, we say we're evidence-based, statistically driven. Uh, we have a, a factors-based worldview, which relates to some of the things that you talked about earlier. And we're fascinated with, uh, the possibility of character as a factor separate from other things that you might look at. So whole field of study. Um, ahead of us there. Uh, but anything you name, there are people <laughs> that are better, better than I am. You know, we've got a, we've got a, a woman who's, well, we've got two, two women who are really good at project management. I mean, really good. And this is not like my first cup of tea. Like I work really hard just to stay up and be average, but these people are really solid at it. Um, they're, you know, statistics. And then it's the combination of people that are amazing at the anal analytical side, but because we hire for, uh, for values and culture, um, they have this mix. Um, one, of, one of my heroes, we were talking about heroes, one of, the, one of my heroes on our team is Kai Lu, who came in and he is, we have statistical ways of measuring your, your brain and what you're good at, and he's off, off the charts on analysis, this guy. <laughs> is way out there. Most people that are that strong at something, the other side is going to be weak. And, um, and, and, you know, some people that are that bright, they just want to sit behind a screen and, and ask everybody to leave them alone. And there are jobs in the world where that's appropriate and would be a good fit. It's not a good fit at Bridgeway. This guy comes in at that level and he distinguishes through servant leadership. He says, if I'm going to be the person I want to be, if I want to have the relationship with my wife and kids that I want to have, I've got to learn how to do this better. And everybody starts wherever they start. And I, and I just watch this guy just intentionally makes that decision. I'm going to learn how to do this and get better. And it's beautiful. You think like, you know, it's like, I love working with him just on the, you know, he'll, there'll be some statistical problem that we're trying to solve, but I'm also working with a guy that, you know, would, would bend over backwards to do whatever he could for you. And he doesn't have to be behind a computer screen to do it. Um, so that's, you know, that's how some, you know, it all fits together. So, um, yes, I'm a leader, uh, at Bridgeway and I'm the chief investment officer and founder, but, uh, for it, more than 20 years, I've been giving, I've been giving up, you know, hats. Um, when you're a real small firm, you do everything. And I remember the day that our head of trading came in and said, John, I need you to hang up the instant terminal. It's like, I need you to stop trading because frankly, I wasn't as good at it as the other people in the team. Um, but we created an atmosphere within Bridgeway where he felt comfortable having that hard conversation. As a matter of fact, he was pretty directive at it. It wasn't a, it wasn't a, it wasn't an ask. It was really, I need you to do this. Um, so that's an example, you know, with that, but within that, think about you, you create opportunities for people to grow. Um, and we're, you know, we're a small company and if you hire really bright people and, uh, really committed, energetic people, you want to make sure that you give them opportunities, uh, to grow. So we think about that, um, a lot. We invest really heavily in professional development. Um, that's part of our annual, you know, goals and evaluation. Um, servant leadership is, is something we do at the corporate level. Um, and all of that blends together to make a place where like, I feel like, oh my gosh, I get to work here. <laughs> well, I love hearing that. I feel like so many leaders pay lip service to that idea because it, it sounds good to say that, but then so many other leaders are threatened by having somebody better than them. And, and it's, 
it really ends up being a lot more of like the Jim Collins, good to great, like tyrant with a thousand helpers. And it's, it's obvious that you actually do that. Um, Dan, what kind of follow-up questions does that bring up for you? Oh, John. Um, well, you know, from my standpoint, um, he, John's, John's a mentor, you know, and as we grow rock investments, you know, we are working to emulate, uh, uh, Bridgeway capital management's, um, culture priorities, um, and things that, uh, that we've been able to be very fortunate in witnessing the benefits and the fruits of growing a company in this way, you know, and I, I think uh, a lot of times people are scared to maybe step out and lead this way because they don't know if it's going to work. And to me, one of the great testimonies of Bridgeway and John is to show people that it works and it doesn't just work. It's been around for 30 years working. Um, and, uh, and, and measurement on the basis of assets versus measurements on the basis of, you know, I, I, I would love to do a, you know, an employee survey of happiness at Bridgeway compared to say other, you know, mutual fund companies, uh, that, that I know John would, would count as a big, uh, big, uh, accomplishment, you know, as it relates to measurements of return. And that's the thing that I think just it's important to kind of get back to is that, uh, the, the, the fundamental premise of our investment strategy, uh, return on character is that, uh, behaving in this way actually does outperform over time, behaving with integrity, behaving with responsibility, forgiveness, and compassion. It does outperform over time. And the th investments thesis is that the market today has just undervalued that. And, uh, I, I guess for me, I just feel so privileged to have a guy like John, on with us talking about his experience as a testimony to the success of the theory of, of our investment approach. And, uh, and I, I, Dan, let me, yeah, go ahead. I, 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 I want to pause this is a bit tangential, but I think it's, I think our uh, listeners would find this uh, fascinating because um, I agree with Dan's hypothesis that character matters. Like it's just intuitive to me from looking at different uh, parts of life. And it's also makes sense to me um, that uh, uh, that companies led by high character leaders should outperform over time. And eventually that gets built into your stock price. Um, so uh, uh, there's a, a, a company in a, a, a book that Dan found called, uh, called Return on Character. That's where the uh, moniker comes from by a firm called KRW. Um, international and they they did a seven year research project showing that companies of high led by high character leaders do outperform on some metrics uh, you know around profitability and some other uh, um, worker engagement and some other uh, objective metrics. But of course, we we invest in stocks. We're we're hoping that uh, if these companies are continuing to get better, then the stock price should uh, reflect that over time as well. Um, and so I believe that, but let's say that we're wrong. Let's say even, even with Dan's early work 20 years ago, which we went back and, and dissected, uh, in the way that we do. And, and it's like, that's one of the things that the other things come is like, oh, there's something here. There's something going on. We need to understand this better, but let's say that we're wrong on all that. Would you, would you rather have an index fund of the entire market or would you ha rather have an investment strategy? built upon similar exposures to the market of say size and value and uh, sector. So you're, you know, you're not, you're not getting way a field of um, basic market exposures, but, but wouldn't you rather have a portfolio that's put together of people of high character um, that have all these other tangential things that, that flow from it. One of the things that I think is really cool is if you look at, at the port, at the portfolio, um, of, 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 uh, you know, rock strategy. Uh, these are companies that have, uh, a, a higher percentage of women at the helm. Uh, they have a, a higher, uh, uh, you know, ESG score, uh, by some measures. Um, they have, uh, uh, lower than benchmark, um, debt and higher return on equity. Well, 
those last things are factors that we can measure. Didn't surprise me because we've, you know, we, we do back testing. That's what we do. Um, but the other ones, like we didn't set out to accomplish, they, those were not inputs, though. those were outputs of the model. So you think there's, again, it's like, there's something going on here and all else being the same, let's say that they were wrong. And there, you know, there are, there are people that believe all these factors, even character have to be incorporated in the market. So you're, you, you know, you might as well just index. Wouldn't you rather have market exposure that recognizes and rewards high character people? Wouldn't you rather? Yeah. Well, I, I think about the Warren Buffett saying where he says, you really want people who, who have, um, who are highly intelligent and, uh, who are, uh, going to work hard, you know, have high activity and you have high integrity because if you're missing, but if you're missing that last one, those first two are going to kill you because they're going to use all that energy and intelligence to make your money theirs. So yes, I definitely would want a portfolio like that. You know, you think about, you know, the 20 years or so that I've been pretending to be an adult and the, the Enrons and the, the things that have happened of, you know, high energy, high intelligence people who are missing that third element, that did not go well for the investors. So no, I wouldn't want to be an investor of those ones. I think that's so true. I, I love the, the, you know, the, 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 the kind of gutsy uh, conclusion uh, from Buffett is like, if you have a person that's not of high integrity, you want them to be dumb and lazy. <laughs> like, oh, that's an interesting thought. <laughs> okay. But you mentioned Enron. I'm uh, Bridgeway's uh, located and I was raised in, in uh, Houston, which was the hometown of Enron. Uh, and I have to tell you, like, that was a, that was a character study for me. Uh, and we use that. There's a, film based on Enron called the smartest guys in the room. Um, and I use that, uh, for training purposes. Sometimes watch that film and ask yourself the question, at what point did these people get off track and how did they get off track? And I don't believe that these people woke up in the morning and said, I'm out to, you know, mess people over. Like they think that they're good people, but they start making compromises. And in our culture, in both business and outside of business, there's a, you know, there are a lot of opportunities to get off track. You, you need to be sharp. You need to think about what's important. Again, that's why I like the kind of simplistic simplicity of four metrics that, um, that, uh, rock investments and, and before them, they borrowed this from KRW international, went back and looked at, um, uh, cultures across centuries um, and and uh, across cultures around the world. And these are the four that they came up with. Um, different countries, different cultures, different religions. Uh, these are a common theme um, and you can get your head around them. The uh, definition of character as we as we use it uh, is is based around four pillars, which is integrity, uh, doing what you say you're going to do, uh, walk in the walk, uh, responsibility, uh, you know, showing up and, um, uh, trying to make the world a better place. Um, forgiveness, being willing and having the capacity to forgive others and probably forgive yourself and empathy, which is, uh, the ability to, to relate with others, uh, have, have empathy for others and empathy for, for yourself, um, and relate, uh, with, with just the average, average individual. Um, and you know, those are the, those are the characteristics defined by return on character, which is the book published by Harvard business review, uh, written by Fred Keel and the basis of a lot of our, of our, uh, uh, of our work and our approach to the market. So John, that was terrific. I, I totally agree with everything you said. Uh, I think, you know, I, what I'd like to think, is that there's enough of us out there in the world that would invest in this strategy, uh, even if it didn't make money, because we know it's so important. Um, we, of course, hope that it will and are doing so because we think it will. But uh, at the end of the day, you know, many of us uh, have to come together and affirm a certain behavior set and what what's unique about 
our opportunity with Rock Investments is that in the marketplace, we can send a signal to the world, specifically Wall Street, that there's a lot of people out there that, that think character matters. And we need to make it a priority in the way we allocate our capital. Um, so thank you very much for everything you said. And uh, I want to bottle it up and, and use it because you say it in such a wonderful way. Jess, do you have any closing closing discussions or any questions that you want to a congratulations on being in business for 30 years. I mean, I, I heard your, uh, I heard your initial point about it was a good thing you didn't study entrepreneurship because then you would have found out about the statistics of the chances of lasting for 30 years. Right. So that's a huge one. And, and so much success. Um, I, I think maybe, uh, a couple things first, if people want to find out more about Bridgeway or they want to connect with you is LinkedIn the best place and, or what's the website for Bridgeway or what would you recommend? Bridgeway.com. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, we've covered so many different subjects here. Uh, I think maybe I'd love to leave, uh, kind of leave the floor to you. What's, what's something that we didn't ask that we should have, or what's something that's important to you that, uh, that you think would be great to leave people with here today? Um, Jess, I would say, uh, you know, when you, when you hear podcasts of successful people, you think, oh, you know, like, Here's a guy that went to Harvard Business School, so he has a leg up. Or here's a person, you know, that had resources that I didn't have. Or, you know, he's the owner of the company, so he can do things in his company that I can't do. And those are all wrong. Those are, I mean, to put it most bluntly, their excuses. You can always find somebody with more resources, brighter, whatever, on any metric. I mean, you know, unless you're the richest person in the world with respect to wealth, or you just received the gold medal in some event at the Olympics, none of us can, you know, claim to do this. And, and that's not my goal. My goal is to be who I was created to be and to work with people that, you know, are similar uh, purpose uh, minded. And, and everyone listening, everyone listening to this podcast is a powerful person and can be more, can continue to learn and figure out how to, to show up. And character is one great place um, to start. So I just want to in, encourage and also challenge everyone on the, on the line here um, that, uh, you know, don't say, oh, well, you know, Dan's done all these things. And so of course he can, you know, he's got these resources and he's an inspiring speaker. And so of course he can just like, no, that's not the place to go. Where is it that you can show up in a relationship with a client or a family member or somewhere else, uh, something that you'd like to take the next and just take it on, just see what happens. It's inspiring. I love it. I think that's great advice for all of us. Um, John, thanks so much for doing this. We're, this is so much fun. I have like three more hours of questions. We're going to have to have you back on at some point. <laughs> well, it's been fun. Thanks so much, uh, Jess and Dan, both for inviting me on. Uh, it's been great. 